I'm uh, Roy Wood, and this is my little den here. Welcome. Um, rule number one, we've got lots of things to look at here, so put your glasses on. Hello. Here we are. Right, when we first decided to get this programme together, um, we couldn't quite make up our minds as to what level of standard to aim for. Um, obviously, some people who are watching this may already have uh, experience in recording anyway. But hopefully this program should appeal to uh, the person that's maybe written a couple of songs and needs to get them either played to a record company or needs some sort of vehicle for the general public to hear them. Well, obviously it's quite impossible to squeeze years of experience into a short program like this. But hopefully I'll be able to give you some sort of an insight into uh, getting your songs down onto tape in a presentable format. Righto, a little look at the uh, studio equipment now. Obviously, um, I don't want to go into detail about what everything does at the moment because it will all become apparent as the program goes on. Uh, but this piece of equipment here is the mixing desk, which is our sound station, so to speak, which everything goes into and everything comes out of with um, echoes on and uh, poached and scrambled and whatever you want to do with it, basically. Um, and above there, I've built <coughs> A pod out of some old shelving to rack up some of my effects uh, because I find it easier to reach them from the desk rather than having to walk all around the room. <coughs> uh, I've got uh, compressors, noise gates, echoes, all sorts of stuff there. Over here we've got a, a rack of stuff which is uh, basically echoes. At the bottom there we have uh, our samplers which uh, actually make the sound and the computer next to it drives the sound. You'll notice that I've got them racked up on shelves. Um, that's, that's really to save buying expensive racking equipment. This is an Atari computer um, which I use with a C-Lab music program which I find uh, pretty easy to get uh, arrangements to songs together with and uh, this is the sort of driving force of uh, what we'll be reviewing today. Uh, and this is a remote control unit, which is very useful. Uh, this is to the multi-track machine. It's quite useful to save running backwards and forwards across the room and tripping over the wires. And uh, keyboards, which this, we can bring sampled sounds up to and drive the computer with the keyboard. You might look at all of this gear in my studio here and think, well, how can I afford that sort of stuff? Well, to be perfectly honest, it took me a fair number of years to reach this sort of standard of equipment. And unless you're a bank robber, you could uh, have, a, have a few problems, I reckon. But um, I would advise anyone to uh, look out for second-hand equipment. And as long as you get the right sort of advice, you can save yourself a fair amount of money. And there's not a hell of a lot that can go wrong with it. Initially, you'll find that you have to fork out quite a bit of dosh to get your home studio together. But don't let that put you off, because if you're really serious about what you're doing, at the end of the day, you can save yourself a fortune in what it would have cost you to um, record in a commercial studio. If you're on the lookout for equipment, um, a porter studio type arrangement like this is ideal, really. It gives you more or less everything you want for a, um, a recording setup in the bedroom, all in one little box. And um, you have... Is it, there's a 10-track mixer, uh, there's an 8-track facility which records onto a, to an ordinary cassette, which is great. And you've got plenty of sends for your echoes, auxiliary sends. So that's basically more or less as much as you want to set up a song. And together with um, an Atari computer, you could come out with quite a good product. If you're in the process of setting up a recording studio at home, probably the last thing you'll want to spend money on is soundproofing. But usually, if you've got a, a normal rectangular shaped room with not too many alcoves or dips in the ceiling, you'll find that you don't really have to get too involved in proper acoustic treatment. The main problem you'll need to sort out is insulating the room to avoid A, annoying the neighbours, and B, cutting down noises from outside you'll find that the main escape routes for sound 
are usually the ceiling and the floor and also any gaps around the doors and windows. The easiest way to control these problems is first of all make sure that the floor covering is as thick as possible. Two or even three layers of underlay underneath the carpet would help quite a lot. If you're living in a place that's sort of attached to the people next door it's advisable to insulate the loft with fiberglass. Also stick some more fiberglass to the ceiling and then nail up some plasterboard to form a sort of fiberglass sandwich. If you're the sort of person who sings a bit loud, apart from uh, having your face double glazed of course, you could get a couple of doors and hinge them together uh, to form a sort of a pair of screens and um, pad up the inside of the doors with either old carpet or under felt and then place them in the corner of the room to form a sort of a vocal booth and then the wall that's left treat that with some loft insulation and hang a curtain inside and uh, no, no one are here I don't think. It's a good idea to spend maybe an hour or so writing preliminary ideas of your song down on paper or maybe singing some of the important parts onto a portable cassette player like this, this is the one I use, nice and cheap. Um, it's quite useful when you come to record the song and you're trying to set out how many verses and choruses and the instrumental passage and get them all in the right order. And it saves a lot of problems when you <clears throat> start to record and maybe you've got something the wrong way around and you've got to start all over again. It's very important. If you've never used a mixing desk before, um, don't be put off by all these knobs and switches that you see here because apart from the, uh, this middle section of the desk all these sound modules here are duplicated all the way along the desk so in actual fact if you can learn to use that one you know the whole lot. At the top you usually find the routing switches 1 to 24 on this desk. This enables you to send whatever sound is patched into this fader to any one of 24 tracks on the tape machine or otherwise transfer across to another fader or subgroup on the desk. As we only have 12 buttons here, uh, this selector switch there enables you to choose between either tracks 1 to 12 or 13 through to 24 if you, if you lift it up. That is the stereo switch to enable you to hear what you're doing. This section here is for microphone and line inputs. The two gain controls as you can see one for mic amp and the one below it is for the line in. I'll come down to the EQ section now. Basically it's just a glorified posh version of the treble, middle and bass controls that you have on your hi-fi system at home. We have a row of six rotary, rotary potentiometers commonly known to you lot as knobs. At the top a high frequency control which is a, a 10k boost and cut responsible for the very high sibilant sort of sounds like your hi-hat, that type of stuff. Uh, the bottom knob here is for the low bass frequencies, switchable from 60 hertz to 120 hertz. Uh, the the mid-range controls are in pairs of two, the top two for upper middle register and these other two here are a frequency cut and boost for the low end. The advantage of having this section in what they call parametric pairs is that for instance if they're it's part of a sound frequency of an instrument which you don't really need to be there. You turn this frequency control until you find the offending harmonic or hum or whatever and then simply use the cut and boost control to get rid of it. This little section here is for auxiliary sends which are normally used for echoes and effects units. These are switchable to allow you to use up to six effects on three knobs. A pan pot here so you can pan from left to right in stereo. At the bottom is a monitor cue send section which allows you to get a different balance on the headphones to the one that you have set up on the faders on the desk. This also has a pan pot to change the stereo image in your cans. The main stereo pan pot is just located above the main fader with a mute button which is a glorified on and off switch. And of course one of the most important things here, the old fader. You don't need to try and get too technical with EQ. There are no sort of set rules. Basically, you just fiddle around until you find the sound that you like and use it. I know I have. Uh, the section of the desk I haven't mentioned yet is this middle bit. You'll find that every desk um, is 
a different animal when it comes to auxiliary sends and returns, monitor queue facilities, that sort of thing. All you need to know about this for now is that this top group of modules are set up to take different types of echo and reverb. Two stereo reverbs here, one stereo echo, and one mono job that I use for a double tracking effect. We have um, eight subgroups at the bottom, <coughs> which are mainly used if you need to group a bunch of instruments together and control the lot with one fader, such as uh, drums or vocal harmonies. Alternately, you can use them as echo returns or just normal faders if you're running short of room on a mix. On this center strip here, um, you have the master faders, uh, which send out the main source of the sound from the desk. And uh, you've got a, got a mute button there if you want to make it a bit quieter. We've got a talkback button here. So you can uh, press it and talk to the bloke next door and say, Oi, that's a load of crap. See? And then we've got a selector switches for the, the main stereo output, uh, headphone volume control, level for the monitors in the control room, a selector switch so that you can, you can play it back on small speakers if you want to. And those are selectors for selecting different tape machines like the... Uh, you know, you've got tape one, tape two there, which I've got my um, video tape coming back on. And uh, these at the top are connected to the um, cassette player so that you can send your main mix out from the desk to the cassette player. And you can also play back here as well. You've got a, got a volume for that. At the end of the desk here, you see the um, jack field or patch bay, which basically connects anything up to anything. And this... Uh, Nice little red job out here is for making the tea. And now we present your MIDI wiring diagram. Number one. Connect the keyboard input to computer out. Step two, connect keyboard out to SIMT synchronizer in. Number three, connect your keyboard through to your sampler input. Finally, the SIMTI synchronizer output is connected to the computer in. Good luck. Right, onto the samplers. Um, I have a rack of samplers here which um, sampling, in effect, is a way of uh, grabbing sounds and being able to store them digitally onto one of these disks 